you have a Bible, go ahead and go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. As I mentioned earlier, we're starting a nine-week series uh, today. We will go all the way until the end of November, and the topic is faith. Um, we'll be asking the question, what is faith? What does faith do? And then what, is, what does faith look like in the past? And so each week, today will just kind of be an overview of Hebrews 11, so we'll jump back and forth through Hebrews 11. It's a long chapter, um, so we're just going to kind of give the big highlights today. And then each week going forward, we're actually going to look at some of the people that the chapter mentions, like Abel, Noah, Sarah, Rahab, these different people from the past that God would commend their faith two different times, maybe three. He, God commends their faith in Hebrews 11. And so I think it's good to ask the question, why? Like God looks at a human being and commends their faith. And so I think it's good for us to say, why would God do that? What is it about them? What is it about who God is that would say, these people, we give it, uh, their con- com- commendation of faith. And so each week we'll look at a different story, not just to tell the story, but to look specifically at their faith. What is it about their faith that, God, uh, that makes God mention them in Hebrews 11? So uh, I'm going to read all of Hebrews 11. It is a long chapter, and so I encourage you, um, as I go through this, because we're going to be in this chapter for the next nine weeks, as we go through this, make a mark, um, if you've got your Bible out, on, on words or phrases that you see that you want to come back to over the next nine weeks and ask God, what do you want to show me in this chapter? Um, what, do you want to, what do you want to teach me? How do you want to mold me through this chapter? And so uh, I'm going to read all of Hebrews 11, and then we'll pray. Starting in verse 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, though which he was commended as righteous, God commended him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. That's going to be a fun one, by the way. Um, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because he had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is, faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed in an ark for saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him as the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had a promise. Therefore, one man is him as good as dead, or born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, as many as an innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged the way were stra- uh, they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had no oppor- they have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau, and by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of a staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus 
of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not, of, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. Imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword, they were about in skins and sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of, of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. All right, so next nine weeks, we will be using Hebrews 11 as our guide. And in Hebrews 11, we're going to see both an explanation and a model, that we will see God explain to us what faith in is, and we'll see him model others who have come before us that God looks at and he commends their faith. And, and here's my hope for us as a church as I was thinking about this week, that as we walk through this chapter the next nine weeks, God would activate in our hearts what we know in our heads that we would be able to live out what we've heard about for so long, that we would be able to feel it, to touch it, to, to breathe it, to actually experience what it means to live by faith. All right, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. Go, go with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And in this text, these two verses, we're actually going to see Hebrews 1 through 11 summed up. Because I know there's some of you like, okay, you're really going to do just Hebrews 11. <laughs> you can't do Hebrews 11 without talking about the whole book. Well, What's cool about these two verses is it actually gives us a full picture of Hebrew. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved. So that's the first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews. I don't know if you've read the book of Hebrews before, but that's the first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews. So for, gra- for by grace you have been saved. This idea that we have to offer something to God in order for our sins to be forgiven, that idea is gone. The first 10 chapters of Hebrews explains fully the death of the tabernacle. This idea of offering something to God, that God has fulfilled the old covenant with his people and he has made, made a new covenant with us. And in this new covenant, Christ has paid the price for our salvation. By grace, you have been saved. So your works, your morality, it does not give you right standing with God. You can't do enough good things to be in right standing with God. It is God who has saved you. He did the work. He paid the price. That the cross of Christ gives us right standing with God. There is nothing that we can lay at the altar of God to make him love us. Christ laid himself on the altar, and he saved us. That's the first 10 chapters of Hebrews. Now, the rest of verse 8, this is Hebrews 11 and 12. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Through what? Faith. He says, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So by grace you have been saved through faith. But even the faith required for salvation 
was not produced by you. This is a work of God. See, I think sometimes we think of, okay, grace is from God, but faith, that's on me. You ever thought that? Faith, that's on me. If life is bad, I don't have enough faith. Or if, God, if I think God thinks of me as bad, that's because I don't have enough faith. Like, grace is from God, but faith, that is completely on me. But if that were true, if your faith was dependent on you, then what trust would you have that your salvation was legit? If faith was dependent on us, then it could create one of two scenarios for us. Either it would make us incredibly insecure people, always wondering if God really loves us or not. Always wondering. Always wondering if we were doing enough works for God to love us. When we are good, we are happy because God loves us. And when we are bad, God hates us because our faith is bad. The second scenario it could create for us is believing in believing that faith is dependent on us is it could make us incredibly arrogant people. Incredibly arrogant people. Well, if they would just have faith like me, if they would just believe like I believe, then they wouldn't feel that way. It can make us incredibly arrogant people. But what does the text say? This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So there is no room for boasting because the faith that produces grace both come from the same source. And so here's the question that I want to ask before we jump into Hebrews 11. Why is it so easy for us to explain grace? Because most of us in here can explain grace, the grace of God. Why is it so easy for us to explain grace, but so few of us actually live in it on a daily basis? What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? For most of us, including myself, we can intellectually understand the doctrine of grace, but so few of us live in the freedom that it brings. We can explain it, but every day we're wondering if we're good enough. We're wondering if God really loves us or if he has a plan for us or if he actually cares about the direction of my life or the decisions that I make. So let me read it again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And here's what I want you to hear before we jump into Hebrews 11. Faith is the spark that ignites the idea of grace in our souls. Until there is faith, grace is an abstract idea. Until there is faith, grace is an abstract idea. But when faith takes root in our hearts, the idea of grace is awakened, and we can see it, we can feel it, we can experience it, we can believe it, that when faith has taken root in our souls, it produces freedom for us. Freedom. I don't have to earn anything. I don't have to prove anything. Um, This isn't in my notes, but I was just thinking about this. Anybody here, here ever seen the show Wipeout? All right, I don't know if that still plays or not. I am getting old, you know. Um, but Wipeout, it's basically what it is. People run around, and they get beat, and they fall down. And um, the second round of that show, it's like the spinny wheel, you know what I'm talking about? And people kind of have to balance over, and when they get to the other side, I, this always fascinates me, right? So at the very beginning of that second round, people are like beating each other, elbows, they're competing, punching each other, they're, they're trying to win, But when they get to the other side, what happens? They celebrate. They start cheering people on. They start giving them tips like, hey, watch out for that. Move your head, right? Because why? Because something has activated in them, and they're secure. They're assured. My my spot is secure here. So I don't have to beat and push and try to prove anything anymore. I don't have to earn anything. My place is already here. So now when I look back at everybody else, I'm free. I'm secure. And when faith activates in our hearts, it produces in us grace. This idea, this this idea that I'm secure. God has paid the penalty for me. He has saved me. So I'm free now. I'm free. I don't have to earn anything anymore. So, okay, now we can go to Hebrews 11. The first question we have to ask is, what is faith? What is faith? Uh, The dictionary actually has 17 definitions for the word faith. I'm not going to waste your time by reading them because the Bible gives us a definition. Hebrews 11.1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are 
visible. All right. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So follow me here. To hope in something means that the current state of our circumstances is filled with discontentment. That whatever circumstances you are in is not pleasing to you. If there is hope, it's because you're unsatisfied. If you hope that one day you will get married, it's probably because right now you're not. Like there's not a lot of married people hoping that one day they'll be married. If there is, we got a problem, right? If you hope that your marriage is better one day, like you have some goals and some things that you say, I want my marriage to look like this, it's probably because your marriage right now doesn't look like that. If you hope that one day the Cowboys will win the Super Bowl, it's because you know that this year they're not going to, right? If you hope that one day you will have more money, it's because you are discontent with the amount of money you have right now. The foundational element of faith is actually, I think, a discontented heart. That for every single person on the, blo- on the globe, rich, poor, black, white, Asian, whatever, for every person in every socioeconomic class, we all have one thing in common. We are all, all in our core, discontent with this life. There is something that could be better. And without discontentment, there is no hope for something more. So, if faith is the assurance of all things hoped for, could it be then that the worst thing God could give you is your worldly desires fulfilled? What if your wish to be wealthy, healthy, and safe actually came true? Where does faith fit into that? So let me say something that uh, could be hard to hear, I think, but I think it's true. Um, your suffering, whatever that is for you, your suffering, your discontentment, it's actually a gift. It's a gift because it produces in you hope for something better. It's a reminder that you weren't created to be self-sufficient. You weren't created to, to be able to provide everything that you need for yourself. You were not designed to be able to provide everything you need for your life to be whole. So discontentment reveals to us our need for the one who designed us. So, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So here's what happens in faith. God looks at my discontent soul, grabs it, and he aims it at the cross of Christ. And my soul responds and goes, yes, yes, that's what I was looking for. It's the assurance of things hoped for. It's believing that the reasons I was discontent was not because I didn't have enough money. It wasn't because I wasn't married. But in Christ, my discontentment is turned to joy despite my circumstances around me because in Christ, I have found my assurance of what I hoped for in the beginning, that I wanted joy, I wanted hope, I wanted freedom. And in Christ, I'm assured that what I hoped for was real. Does that make sense? Now look at verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. So in faith, we begin to see the universe as something that was intentional, that, that God created the earth, the stars, the fish, the grass. He created it all, including you and me, and he did it from the words of his Mouth, and that everything we are able to see was created by something that we can't see. Think about that. And now, okay, we'll come back to that. Jump down to verse six. He says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So it begins with a discontented spirit. We feel that there is something more, that There is something that is unseen, something invisible, a greater authority and pleasure that we begin to long for, and we desire it, and that stirs in our souls something that draws us near to Christ, that God puts in us something that draws us near to him, and we draw near to Christ because God has put in us faith that tells us he's the only one that can do it. He's the only one that can do it. He's the only one that can do it satisfy that discontentment in your heart that you struggle with every single day. 
And so therefore, whoever draws near to God must believe that he exists. That he exists. Because if he didn't exist, there would be no satisfaction. If he didn't exist, there would be no satisfaction. There is no satisfactory punishment for sin and no satisfaction for our souls outside of Christ. Okay, it's a lot of, let's pull it all together. The first foundational piece of faith is discontentment. It stirs us to draw near to the satisfactory blood of Christ. Okay, that's the second. So the first foundational piece is discontentment. The second is that when we draw near to Christ, we find assurance for what we had hoped for. We find assurance for what we had had hoped for. And the third piece of defining faith, this foundational piece, I think, is that faith repeats itself. Faith repeats itself on a daily basis, that my life, your life, is nothing but the faith that God put in us going, remember my promises, remember my promises, remember my promises. That the flesh in us wants us to rebel, it wants us to run away, the enemy wants to push us out of the word of God, and the spirit in us is telling us through the word of God and through the community of God, Remember my promises. Remember who I am. Remember who you are. So that's the foundation of faith, that the root of faith is discontentment, that faith draws us near to Christ, and faith repeats the same process over and over again. Now, let's talk about what faith does. Three things that faith does. First, it creates anticipation for us. Faith creates anticipation. It produces in us conviction for the things that are unseen, like think about it. We have not seen a place that there, where there are no more tears. We haven't seen a place where there is no more pain, right? If you have, tell me where that is. But we haven't seen it yet. We are convicted that it exists, right? We're, we anticipate that place because we are convicted that it exists. Faith always anticipate something better. We haven't seen it, but we know it's real. It always anticipates that the promises of God will come true. It doesn't matter how long we have to toil or struggle or how long we have to wait. That faith perseveres because we know we have assurance that something better is coming. Something better is coming. And this is why, by the way, that it's so important that we as a faith family stay centered on the scriptures. Like you remember last week, we talked about the word being like a sword in Hebrews 4, that like, like a sword, it cuts through all the muck and the mire and the noise of the world. And when it gets down to where it goes, at the bottom of our souls, it starts shining a bright light. And in that light, it's not just revealing our goodness and our badness, but what is it revealing? Our unbelief. Our unbelief. And it looks at our unbelief and it says, be assured. Be assured that the promises of God are true. Something better is coming. That, the, that in the scriptures we see the promises of God, anticipation birthed in faith. And where there is assurance and anticipation, there is always movement. There is always movement. And that's the second thing that faith does, is faith moves. That when faith is assured and you begin to anticipate the promises of God, your faith begins to move you into action. Jump with me down to verse 32. Verse 32. He says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith watched Netflix. <laughs> who through faith were filled with self-pity. No. They started moving. It says who faith conquered kingdoms. And it goes on and on and all, which, all the ways in which faith moved. Like, you remember the Battle of Jericho? It's mentioned in verse 30. We're not going to cover it, so I'll talk about it here. But in Joshua 5 and 6, it's the first major battle of the Promised Land, the city of Jericho. There are massive walls all around it. Joshua is leading the Israelites. They've been training for 40 years, 40 years. And they ask the question, okay, how are we going to take this city? It's got massive walls around it. How are we going to get through those walls? Well, they have five options. They can go under the wall, they can go over the wall, they can break through the wall, they can do a Trojan horse type thing and get inside the wall, or they can starve the people 
out. And God comes to him and he said, okay, here's the battle plan. Get your music guys and get them to play some tunes. And once they played some songs for a few days, everyone's going to shout and then the walls are going to come down. Can you imagine training for a battle for 40 years, and then you turn to those soldiers and say, hey, we're just going to give it to the trumpets? It's an absurd battle plan. But think about it. By faith, they were assured what would happen. They were assured. They hadn't seen it, and it'd be crazy to believe it. But they were assured of what would happen by God. And their faith moved them to, moved them into action. Faith is not static. It grows. It creates ambition, and it, des- it creates desires. It creates affections. And this is so important for us to understand because I think, I think that there are too many Christians who are just bored. You're just, you're just bored. You're, you're, you're static. You're, there are too many of us, and I would go further, there are too many of us who gather together with a faith family. And you come in here, you're, you're hurt, you're struggling with sin, anxiety, frustration. We gather week after week, and all we do is learn the Christian language. But we're, we're static. And as gently as I can, I mean, I just want to say, it's not faith that you have. It's something else. Because faith says, okay, faith says, Christ can heal me. He tells me, confess and repent, and you will be healed. So why aren't we confessing our sin? Right? Go, James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So if you're going, okay, I know I'm supposed to confess my sin, but I don't want to. Let me just ask you, why? Like, sin's got a hold on you. Why, why don't you want to? If, if Scripture says, hey, you confess this sin and repent, like, I'm going to heal you. So I say, why? And you say, well, okay. I don't want to confess because, I mean, it's embarrassing. Right? I, don't want, I don't want to put this out there. I don't want people to see me this way. I don't, I don't want people to know this. We dig a little deeper, and it's typically, okay, well, why is that embarrassing? Well, I've, I mean, I guess I'm prideful. I mean, I've got pride in me. Okay, go deeper than that. Typically what it is, it's, well, I don't know, really know that God can actually heal me from this. I don't, I don't know that God can actually transform me to not struggle with this. It's a lack of faith. It's a lack of assurance. I'm discontent. Can God really give me this? But faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I hope to be healed. It's the assurance that says, God can do this. God can heal me. Like anxiety. There's so many things things that the world has to say about anxiety. And I believe in medicine. I believe that those are, things are required for some people. But, but let's not move past the reality that there is a movement of faith in our anxiety, in our frustration, in our emotions. There is a piece of that. That, that Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And then what's the, what's the hoped for? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, that faith moves us into action. It anticipates something. It anticipates God working the way that he wants to work. It it anticipates, it moves. And the third thing that I would say that faith does is faith perseveres. Faith perseveres. Look at verse 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. Which, I mean, by the way, I mean, you think about those of you who struggle with frustration, anxiety, different sin struggles. I mean, it's, it's assured and it's hoped for and God can do it, but he will do it on his timing. Which means that you may not be healed immediately. You may have to struggle a lot and get help from community. I just want to point that out. Because I don't want to be the pastor that makes promises that I... I can't deliver that. Only God can deliver that. And that's his timing on how he wants to heal you from the thing that you have going on. Okay. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Okay. 
Consider Abraham. God comes to him and he says, I'm going to make a people through you. I am taking you to a far better land and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Your descendants will be like the stars in the sky. And Abraham dies in a tent without seeing any of that happen. Now, go to verse 39. It says, all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God, and we're going we're gonna to come back to this a few different times throughout this series. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So here's what I'll say about this for today. I think sometimes we think of those in the Old Testament as if they are completely disconnected from us. We read, we read their stories like we would a fictional novel. They're stories, and that's all that they are. But here's the reality. We are eternally connected to Abraham, to Noah, to Sarah, to Rahab, that we are in the midst of a testimony, a testimony, not a story, that began long before us and will continue, continue to herald long after we're gone, and we are in the midst of a providential timeline of God. And at most, we are a one-second soundbite. But that soundbite matters because it's all part of the same testimony. So let me ask a question for us to chew on. Why does God commend those who are mentioned in this chapter? Why does he commend them? And here's kind of what I want us to think about over the next several weeks. Could it be that our faith can be assured because Abraham believed God and left his home? Could it be that our faith can be stronger because Noah built a boat when everyone thought he was crazy? Or because Moses lifted his staff and he believed that God could part the Red Sea? See, I think we are assured because there are so many who have come before us who believed him. They believed him. Okay, now consider this. What if your son or daughter could be assured of their faith because in this life you believed? Because in this life you struggled well? Because you modeled to them what it looks like to bring your sin, that you do have sin, that you're not perfect, to bring your anxieties, to bring your frustrations and your discontentment, not to the world, but to God. And we just didn't talk the Christian lingo, but we lived life as, we are, as if we were assured in what we hoped for. And we are convicted by it. What if 20 years from now, their struggle could be less because in the midst of your struggle, you believed? What if the people in this community 20, 40 years from now could have confidence in their faith because of a faith family who called themselves Renewal Church had faith that moved them into those people's homes, into their neighborhoods, and sat with them, and talked with them, and prayed with them, and cared for them. Like, you know, I was just thinking about, thinking about this. I'm 33 years old, by the way. I'm a young buck, okay? I'm a baby, all right? <laughs> I don't know what the clapping means there, but... I was thinking about this, this this week. I'm 33. 50 years from now, if God lets me live that long, I'll be 83, okay? I was praying about this, just thinking about Abraham and Noah and Sarah. I was praying that if I'm 83, that I would be able to tell stories of the saints in this faith family who were faithful. Just looking around the room, I'm not calling you old, but there's going to be a lot of you who aren't here in 50 years. <laughs> Take that how you want. I'm not saying names. But I am looking around the room, and I am going to say if you need I mean, I'm looking at you guys. <laughs> Pam Cleveland. But looking around the room, man, 50 years from now, we're three years old as a faith family. When we're 53, the stories of you guys, that the next generation would be assured of their faith because there have been people who have walked before them 
who did it well. That God gave them the faith to move in and out of every day. And they didn't complain. <laughs> they, they, they didn't walk around frustrated all the time, but they pointed us, the faith family, towards Christ. I, I hope that I'm alive at 80 and I can tell those stories. I think about people that I know that have passed away, and you probably have many people that you have modeled to you what it looks like to have faith. And that's who Noah and Abraham and Sarah, that's who these people are. They did that without having that security around them. But they believed God. They believed him. And I pray that we don't waste the next 50 years on fleeting pleasures, pointless squabbles, <laughs> and the comforts of this world, but that we would be a faith family that would have real faith that perseveres, that clings to the reality that God is with us, molding us into who he wants us to be. Now, let me throw a curveball at you. Go to Hebrews 12.1. This is the second curveball I've thrown. I'm sorry. Go to Hebrews 12.1. I know this is serious on Hebrews 11, but you can't talk about Hebrews 11 and not mention Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12.1. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. All right, so he says, therefore. What's the therefore? Well, therefore, chapter 11. <laughs> because we have seen that faith anticipates, faith moves, faith perseveres, and since we have such a cloud of witnesses, we have an audience in heaven watching us. And the text is basically saying here, now it's your turn. Their time is done. It's your turn. That we are here because of the faith and the spilled blood. We didn't even go through that section about the, the mocking. and Faith and spilled blood of the generations before. And the text says, so let us lay aside every weight and sin. So it lists two things, okay? Two things that we need to lay aside. And the ESV calls the first thing weight. Lay aside weight. Here's what that means. That there are things that are morally neutral things. Like you wouldn't look at that thing and say, oh, that's a sin. Like it's not clear, right? Morally neutral things that you wouldn't call a sin. And there are things that are morally neutral that keep you from running the race that is set before you. I don't know what that is for you. I've identified a few, and I'm not even going to mention because I'm not going to play the role of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let God tell you what that is. But there are things in our lives that aren't sin that keep us from running the race. They keep us. They distract us. They, they change our attention. They move our feet to look at in something else other than Christ. And so I don't know what those things are for you. And he says the second thing we have to lay aside is our sin. And the only way we can lay those two things aside is because of verse 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, that in every moment of every day, we have to look to Christ. Why? Because he did the work, not us. And because he did the work, he sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father, right now, when 1 John says he's interceding on our behalf. And so we look to him in our discontentment. All right, just one last thing I want to mention. <clears throat> because, you know, when we talk about faith, and if you're like me, you get excited, and you're like, oh yeah, I just want to conquer the world now. Hold on. At some point, I don't mean to be the Debbie Downer, but at some point this week, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. At some point this week, you're going to get frustrated. At some point, you're going to get angry. At some point, you're going to dive into that sin once again. You're going to neglect digging into the word of God, or you're going to feel bad that you didn't pray enough. You're going to sin. It's inevitable. You are human. And when that happens, this is what I hope the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind. God seeing your faith as commendable is not dependent on you being perfect. It's not dependent on you being perfect. I mean, look at the people that God would say, these are our models. Abraham pimped out his wife. Noah, I'm not even going to get into that. 
right? <laughs> Moses killed the dude, right? I mean, I can go on. A, the list of sins among these people is deep and long, but hear this. God used every single one of them, and he commends their faith, not because of them, but because their eyes were set on a promise. Their eyes were set on a promise that a Messiah was coming for them to free them from their sins, and we're no different. We are no different. You will sin this week, but that does not mean that your faith has to turn into despair because faith repeats itself over. God gives us the strength every single day, and he says, look to me for your assurance. Take that discontent heart and find assurance in the things that you hope for because you were designed to be satisfied in me. So, my hope in this series is that God would put our feet on strong ground that would allow us to anticipate, to move, and to persevere for the next, I don't know how many years, until God says renewal church is no more. But that we would anticipate that God would work, anticipate that his blood was enough, that we would move, that we would believe that God could heal us, strengthen us. We would believe that God could save people in this city, people in the unreached part of the world, people that we don't even know that we're being, going to be sent to yet, and that we would persevere. That, man, we, we're only three years old. Look at how much has happened in three years. But God has not, he's not done with us yet. I have no idea what the next three years <laughs> could bring. But there are going to be some of us in here that are going to have a really hard next three years, and you don't even know it yet. And my prayer is that at the end of this series, you would have a foundation for perseverance, that you would know that God will complete what he is doing in you. Thank you.